Luke chapter 1 in 5 minutes. If you want this free outline of the chapter, it's linked down below. This chapter might be a little bit longer than 5 minutes. Two reasons for that. Number one, this is the longest chapter in the New Testament. Number two, we have some introduction information for the Gospel of Luke. Gospel just means good news, and Luke wrote this to give us the good news about a guy named Jesus. Luke was a traveling companion of the Apostle Paul. We read about that in the book of Colossians. And he also may have been a Gentile, which is an interesting detail, because that means that a Gentile wrote more of the New Testament than any other single author, even Paul himself. Luke wrote the Gospel of Luke, and he also wrote the book of Acts, and he just edged out Paul and the length of his writings. Luke's Gospel is addressed to a man named Theophilus, who may have been a Roman official. And Luke wrote to him to give him confidence about the facts of the Christian faith and to give him confidence in the things that he believed. A lot of people think Luke's Gospel may have been used as part of Paul's legal defense when he was on trial in Rome. And the book records events that happened in the first century AD, so that's 1 AD, or if you want to get really technical, maybe like a couple years before that, all the way to about 33 AD. So what about chapter 1? When did that happen? Well, it happened right at the beginning, right around 1 AD. Herod the Great was the king set up by the Roman Empire during that time, and Augustus Caesar was on the throne of Rome. So that's the when. Let's talk about the who. Let's talk about the characters that are important here. There's a few characters that we're going to be introduced to. The first, Zachariah and Elizabeth. They are a married couple. The Bible says that they were righteous and they were blameless before God and they kept all of God's commandments. And Zechariah was a priest. He was from the tribe of Levi. They are going to have a baby son and that son's name is going to be John. We'll talk about that just uh, in a second. And then we have Mary and Joseph, another couple. They're not married yet, they're betrothed, which is kind of like being engaged. Mary is a young woman from the town of Nazareth, and the text says that she's a virgin, and Joseph is her espoused husband. And then we have another individual who's not a man or a woman, he's actually an angel, and that is Gabriel. He's an angel that comes from the presence of God to give good news to Elizabeth and Mary. Where did the events of chapter 1 take place? Well, they take place in three primary locations. The first is the city of Nazareth, which is to the west of the Sea of Galilee. The second is the hill country of Judea, where Zechariah and Elizabeth lived, and then in the city of Jerusalem, where the chapter actually opens. So let's talk about overview now. The first four verses of the chapter are introduction, Luke telling Theophilus that he's writing to him for all of the reasons that we just mentioned. Then the next 20 verses, verse 5 through 25, John's birth is foretold. Zechariah, remember, he's a priest. He's serving God in the temple in Jerusalem, and when he's in there, an angel appears to him. He tells him that he and his wife are going to have a son, and that son is going to be a prophet of God. And not just any prophet. This is going to be a prophet who prepares the way for God to send the Messiah, the Savior of the world. And that was a big deal to, to any Jew this Messiah had been prophesied about. Uh, it wasn't just a big deal to the nation, but it was a big deal to Zechariah and Elizabeth, because up to this point, Elizabeth had been barren. She hadn't been able to have any kids, and she was getting pretty old. Zechariah, because of that, kind of doubts the words of the angel, and the angel's not very pleased. He reminds him of who he is. He says, I'm Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God. He implies that he should have believed him. Because he didn't believe him, Gabriel actually makes Zechariah mute until his words come true, until he has a son. The angel leaves, and after finishing all of his work there at the temple, Zechariah goes home to his wife, and she gets pregnant. She conceives, just like the angel said. The next 12 verses, verse 26 through 38, is about another baby being born. This time, Jesus, who is that Messiah, that Savior. Six months after appearing to Elizabeth, Gabriel makes another appearance to Mary, a virgin in the town of Nazareth, and he tells her that she is going to bear a son. The Holy Spirit is going to miraculously create this child inside of her. The child was going to be the fulfillment of a lot of the promises that God had made to the Jewish people in times past. And he would be called the Son of the Most High. And he would sit on King David's throne. King David was a, a Jewish king who lived about a thousand years before Jesus. Jesus was going to sit on his throne. Mary accepts the words of the angel and accepted the role that God gave her to play. Then in verses 39 through 56, Mary makes a visit to Elizabeth. So both, both women are, are pregnant at this point, and Mary goes to see Elizabeth. 
Mary makes a trip to the hill country of Judea. That's where Elizabeth lived. And we find out here that Elizabeth and Mary were actually relatives. Upon her arrival, the Holy Spirit fills Elizabeth and she blesses Mary. Then Mary is filled with the Holy Spirit and she begins to prophesy. She prophesies about what these two babies, Jesus and John, are going to accomplish in the Lord's service. And then the chapter closes, verse 57 through 80, with the birth of John the Baptist. So John, his birth is announced at the beginning of the chapter and then he's born at the end of the chapter. Elizabeth gives birth to a son. Eight days later, the boy is circumcised, which was Jewish uh, custom, and his, his name is given, just like the angel said, and his name is supposed to be John. And Zachariah's voice is restored when this happens. Remember, he lost it because he didn't believe the angel, but all the things came to pass, and now he gets his voice back, and he uses it to praise God. Let's talk about the big picture now, not just of Luke, but how does this chapter fit into the entire Bible? Well, if you're picking up in Luke chapter 1, and this is maybe the first place you're reading in the Bible, you're kind of picking up in the middle of the story. Two-thirds of the Bible, the Old Testament, is all kind of leading us up to this point. And so now we have this significant birth of these two babies, and this is huge news if you understand the Old Testament. The Jews had been waiting for the Messiah for a long time, and his birth is now right around the corner. And little did they know that he was not just going to be a blessing to the Jewish nation, but he was going to be a blessing and a savior to the entire world. Okay, so let's talk about takeaways, applications. I've got two here. The first one is this. God can take someone or something seemingly insignificant and use it or them in powerful ways. God takes these two women, Mary and Elizabeth, who in their day were insignificant. They weren't from popular families or powerful families. They lived in kind of nowhere towns. God took them because there was one very significant detail about them, and that was that they were faithful to God and they trusted God. He takes those women out of their insignificance, and now, 2,000 years later, we're talking about these two women because God used them in incredible ways. God doesn't need someone great to do something great. And here's the second application. Even faithful people struggle with doubt. Luke opens up his gospel by telling us how faithful Zechariah is, and yet he has a doubt problem when the angel comes to him and tells him of this miracle that's about to happen. That can happen to the best of us. Even faithful people from time to time will struggle with doubt. But what's important is how we respond to the Lord's correction. And this is what we can learn from Zechariah. The angel makes him mute, and we don't see Zechariah complaining about it. We don't see him turning his back on God. What we find is that when the angel's words finally come true, and Zechariah realizes that he should never have doubted in the first place because God always keeps the promises and always keeps his word, what does Zechariah do with his voice that's given back to him? He immediately praises God. Right? The Lord's correction matured him in his faith in the Lord. So we're all going to struggle with doubt from time to time about certain things. What we need to do is to accept the Lord's correction. We need to allow it to shape us and form us and mold us and to make us more mature so that we're better in the end, just like Zechariah was.